It's like telephone game with a book. People slap their knees and say, this is our guy that argued for three acts. Well, if Aristotle didn't create the three-act structure, then it was Elias Donatus. Elias Donatus, great grammarian of Latin. And definitely not a misogynist. Ooh, ooh. Mr. English, Mr. English, hello, me? Yeah, like, so, did you read the text yourself? I don't know Latin. I only heard it from my esteemed literature professor, and they were most reliable. Mr. English, Mr. English, uh, yeah. So, there's no translated versions of Elias Dantis' text, commentary on the comedies of Terence. So, like, um, how are you sure? Then Horace. Uh, uh. Mr. English, Mr. English, hello! Uh, yeah, so, like, have you ever read Horace's text? And I know we've covered a lot of people, but, like, where are the marginalized people? You know, like, women, people of color, people of different sexualities. Well, as you know, Greece and Rome were all white, and only men could write. Mr. English, no! Let me correct that for you. Annyeonghaseyo, Kim Yumi, Amy Dodd. Hello, I'm Yumi Kim, your fantastic but not quite all-knowing guide to world literature. The key persons we are examining today are Horace and Elias Donatus. The common argument is that Elias Donatus argued for the three-act structure, and that Horace argued for the five-act structure. However, this is completely wrong. A few disclaimers up front. I've never studied Latin in my life, beyond the few science words here or there, and maybe through the study of Life of Brian Latin lessons. So because of that, I did use Google Translate for a lot of the texts, though I back-checked with Latin English dictionaries. Since I am not fluent in Latin, as it's a dead language, no one is sure how it sounded like. I will not be able to recite the Latin for you. I deeply apologize to blind and visually impaired consumers of this series and those who would be very entertained by my mispronunciation of Latin words. For this reason, the Latin is in the link in the description box below. The second thing I have to tell you is that we are covering a play by Elias Donatus, who did a review of a play by Terence, which was a comedy, and it had sexual assault in it. Three separate times. While sexual assault is mentioned, I refuse to go into the details of said play, but I will be ranting about Elias Donatus' ideas. I ask everybody in the comments not to mention the specifics of the play, but I will name the play so everybody can manage their triggers. So who was Horace? He was originally known as Quintus Horatius Flaccus. Horace was born in December 65 BCE and died in November 8 BCE. He was known as a lyric poet and a satirist. You can find his original poem in the description box below. First, I should outline that the line between poetry and prose was often blurred. For example, the Odyssey written by Homer was a poem. So was Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikubu. Do you blame me for wanting to mention a woman of color after 
studying all these white cis het men. So the only thing that we got from Horace about story structure was this quote. No play should be longer or shorter than five acts. If you hope that once seen, it will be requested revived, and no god should intervene unless there's a problem that needs that solution, nor should a fourth person speak. Some of the ideas Horace has are still relevant today for poetries, plays, screenplays, and novels. Eschewing bombast and sesquipedalian words when they want their moaning to touch the listener's heart. It's not enough for poems to have beauty. They must have charm, leading their hearer's heart wherever they wish. This is an argument for that emotion is still an important part of place. Situation brings delight or goads us to anger or weighs us to the ground, tormented by grief. Then with tongue interpreting shows heart's emotion. If the speaker's words don't harmonize with his state, the Romans will bellow with laughter, nights and all. He also pioneered the idea of purple prose. I don't think Aristotle would have approved. Weighty openings and grand declarations often have one or two purple patches tacked on that gleam far and wide when Diana's grove and her altar, the winding stream hastening through lovely fields, or the river Rhine, or the rainbows being described. Aristotle loved those fancy ass words. It was also a lot less eloquent. He also believed in consistent character. To attempt fresh characters, keep them as first, introduced from start to end, self-consistent. Mark Twain, U.S. Indian author, also seemed to take from his words, write what you know. He who knows nothing of sport shuns the campus's gear, watches if he's unskilled with ball, hoop, or quoit lest the ring of spectators burst out laughing freely. Yet he who knows nothing of verse still dares to write. Horace said the same basic words first. Despite this, there are things that people would now disagree with Horace about. It's hard to make the universal specific. It's better to weave a play from the poem of Troy than be the first to offer something unknown unsung, unstage, what should be hidden, keep things from sight, that eloquence can soon relate to us directly. Folks shouldn't see Medea slaughter her children, impious Atreus mustn't openly cook human flesh, nor Procne turn into a bird, or Cadmus a snake. Ain't such scenes you show me I disbelieve and hate. This means in the time of the Romans, he did not want to see any violence on the stage. But look at Hollywood now. The key parts to know about Horace is that he loved a good chorus. Like Aristotle. Clearly this is the best part of a play. The chorus should play an actor's part energetically and not sing between the acts unless it advances and is also closely related to the plot. But it is notable that he was not in favor of negative reinforcement as Aristotle was specifically. It should favor the good and give friendly advice. Guide those who are angered. Encourage those fearful of sitting. Praise the humble table's food, sound laws, and justice, and peace with her wide open gates. It should hide secrets and pray and treat the gods that the proud lose their luck and the wretched regain it. Horace does not delineate time as the primary principle of how a play should be structured compared to Aristotle. Horace also does not whine like Aristotle did. Since Horace's core argument is about emotionality then morality with a good chorus, he does not care about the structure beyond that. He would agree with Aristotle that all else is second to a good chorus. Five acts, yes, but
but no definition for what those acts would contain. We can only guess that the plot driver for his structure would be probably morality, and maybe the y-axis would be emotionality. And there you go, that's Horace for you. Who was a Leo Stantis? He lived in the mid 4th century CE, which is about 350 CE. The circumstances of his life and death are a little bit mysterious. He's known as a great grammarian of Latin, mainly for his works Ars Major and Ars Minor. The major text that we are examining is called Commentaries on the Comedies of Terence. It has an unknown publishing date. It's notable that this text has no known translations to English, though there are translations in German. The original text was partially lost, so a complete translation to English would be impossible. But this is where the copy errors come in. It's like telephone game with a book. People slap their knees and say, this is our guy that argued for three acts. Sources such as this say, three of these terms are taken from Elias Donatus's On Comedy and Tragedy, in which it is stated that all dramatic plots can be analyzed into four parts, the prologue, protasis, epitasis, and catastrophe, an organizational scheme that had already been used in Joseph Simon's 1631 Zeno. Yeah, no. Elias Dantes did not argue for that. The prologue does not mention those words anywhere. I checked. I used the Google search on the book. He did use those terms, but he never called those acts. Believe me, I spent several long days looking for the original Latin and then typing it up. It was torture. Thank you. The words prologus, prostasis, epistasis, and catastrophe don't show up until the body of the text when he's making a commentary on the play Adolfi. Basically, it goes like this. People want to look smart, so they use foreign words. For English, we use French and French cognate words. Elias also wanted to look smarter, so he used Greek in his text. For those visually impaired viewers, I know that you can't see this, but all of these words are in Greek, as in in the Greek letters. So let's imagine, say you know that Elias is this great guy. You admire him a lot. You want to feel important. So you take this guy with an untranslated text and look at it and oh my god, it's so many freaking volumes. <sighs> yeah, it's really long. It's several volumes and really expensive. So what to do? So you take the bit of text that looks a little bit different and translate that. So then you look up the Greek, and what you get is, is prostasis, epistasis, and castrophia. You're done! Those must be the acts. But did you read the text? Nope, Elias was misunderstood. Much like Aristotle, he did not argue those as acts. He argued them more like prologue, beginning, middle, an end, much like Aristotle did in Poetics. It is one thing to make copy errors from a text that has been translated before. That has invariably happened, such as the often misquoted, let them eat cake. It was neither cake nor Marie Antoinette. It is another to make assumptions about a text that you have not read in full yet and are only making assumptions based on what other people have told you. Poor Elias, no one read his book and then misunderstood him. Is anyone surprised? 
he'd be crying, except that I'm not that sympathetic. Elias Donatus was in favor of the undescribed five act chorus like Horace. He said in Adolphi, in order to have other plays of this kind, it is necessary to have five acts of courses distinguished from the Greek poets, and though Latin comedians are usually fearful of retaining an offended spectator, this play is not as fearful of offending others. This makes the old plays as separate and distinguishable from the Latin ones. Often the offense in the Greek plays ends with the epilogue narration. In addition, when he uses the words protasis, epitasis, and castropha. He uses them in Greek and then explains them in the footnotes. This goes one step further. He uses them like beginning, middle, and end to describe what emotions that the play gave him. This is also from Adolphi. In this, the prologue is declared somewhat milder. He is more engaged in clearing himself than in injuring his opponents. Protasis is turbulent. The epitasis is loud and the gentler castropha. We have carefully set forth the nature of these parts in the beginning, where we spoke of some comedy. About the play Etra. In this, the prologue is both multiple and overly rhetorical, because oftentimes this comedy is excluded because it needs a very careful defense. And in this, the protasis is turbulent, the milder epitasis, and the softer castropha. I should mention that Etra is the play that you have to watch for. Much like how Layman might tell you, the beginning was really good, the middle was meh, and the ending was terrible. He's doing the same kind of thing, only with jargon. Most people do not talk about movies with. I thought the introduction was really good, but the insane incident was really well timed. The climbing action could have used a little more work, but that climax, it was excellent. And then the falling action, it got a little bit better, but that denouement, oh, that was the best. Nope, most people say that the beginning was really good, the middle was kind of iffy, but the end gave them all of the feels. If there was a prologue, they'll say, was it useful or was it useless? If you want to sound more snobbish, then you would say, the key was really good. The show, I did not expect that much. The 10 was excellent. It had all of the feels, but the ketsu, it sent me onto another plane of existence. Elias Donatus doesn't really explain what he expects the structure of Terence's plays to be. There's far more that I typed up that I didn't put into the link in the description box below to check this. I would feel pity for him, but the poetic justice of him doing it to Greek plays and then people doing it to him amuses me. But basically, all of my sympathy for him fell into the gutter once I read his commentary in Itra, which he said, it needs a careful defense. The careful defense that it needs is because Itra has three separate sexual assaults. And that is not funny, you asshole. And yes, there are different kinds of sexual assaults, but yes, it is that R word. And no, there is nothing funny about sexual assault. And yes, it was misogynistic for his times. Otherwise, why does he think it needs a careful defense? Conclusion. Let's summarize like this. Horace wanted a five-act chorus. So did Elias Donatus. The difference between the two is that Elias Donatus used fancy Greek words to make himself look smarter. Horace did not. Elias used 
fancy Greek words to argue about Terence's plays as substitution for beginning, middle, and end. Horace would have scolded him for this purple prose. So overall, people are invoking Aristotle, Horace, and Elias Donatus to look important by our getting them wrong. In addition, there was no drawing of their act structure used at that time. People are using the text to say this is a whole, not a part of the text. And then scholars are misattributing the text to have things that it does not have. This was where I was frustrated myself. All these attributions, but they lead all to dead ends. Why can't you say that your opinion is your opinion and not use some older white guy to legitimize your opinion with a false attribution? They would not agree with you. Why can't you, as academics, cite correctly? Page numbers? Anybody heard about like proper style? You have MLA, APA, Chicago, Oxford, one of those? Did you fail high school? How did you get your doctorate if you can't cite anything? Beyond that, I was told this once. If there's a prohibition for something, then somebody has done that prohibition. People do not make laws for things that cannot and never could happen. So if Horace and Elias Donatus were both actively arguing for five acts, that means that other act structures were also happening. So if both Horace and Elias Donatus were both actively arguing for five acts, that means that other act structures had happened before. The thing is that these texts are otherwise lost, burned, or otherwise gone. And where are the other marginalized playwrights of the time? They aren't taught in schools. We are often taught that Greek and Romans were all white, but they weren't all white. Greece and Rome were ports of frequent trade from Northern Africa, which includes Egypt and Tunisia. The Iliad happens in Turkey, which kisses Europe, but is not fully in Europe. So building this fantasy of only white men, I have serious doubts. Women did star in some place. Not maybe the Greek ones, but they did star in the Roman ones. And women did write, such as Agrippa the Younger, who wrote diaries. And there were people of color, such as the Emperor Lucius Septimius Severus. So I say to you, does it really serve us to think that these were the only ways to write a play when the sampling is so small and so many of the texts were lost? I hope that if you're a teacher, you are not telling everybody that only men wrote at the time. I was flat out told that this was true, but it's false. False attributions is a theme that continues with our next fifth stop, Shakespeare. In the next episode, we'll cover Shakespeare to about the 19th century. There is a lot of missing information about what the acts contain, but you'll have to be patient. So subscribe and hit that bell, or don't subscribe. <laughs> like or hate the video, but if you're going to debate, leave verifiable, reliable sources and be civil about disagreements. So read more, explore more, see more, love more literature. Let literature light up your world. And see you next time. Meh. I was on Elias Donatus's side as a virtual linguist until I read what the plays were about. And no, sexual assault isn't funny. I have no bones to pick with Horace. I still have thoughts given Tony Robinson's History of Britain series 2, episode 1, BBC, that there should be more input from female writers of the age. When we're taught Greek and Roman texts, they should include women in other marginalized groups. I was flat out told by a lit professor once that there were none, but I have serious doubts given the history of texts 
and such being burned and people not obeying the rules ever? Otherwise, why did Aristotle have to put in so much effort about how women didn't belong in plays and were crappy writers if there were no women writers? See the previous episode if you haven't. And why did he have to rant about slaves being inferior if there were no dissenters? If someone is arguing something, there must be someone that they are arguing against. There is someone who disagrees with them. Always. So there must have been someone. Also, quit teaching that Rome was all white. Seriously.